Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to give a few more people a little time to check in. We started just a little bit late. We want to make sure everybody has time to squeeze in and get comfortable. Uh, if you don't recall, one of our messages is that we're doing this on YouTube Live. So you have the ability to actually watch this on your smart TV or other device. You can get away from sitting at your desktop or on your laptop and kind of relax a little more while we um, do our presentation. So like I said, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Thank you. All right, let's do one more minute, Katie. We'll just wait one more minute and you can go ahead and prompt the beginning. Thank you, everyone. And please get relaxed. Once again, you can watch this on YouTube Live. And see, we are watching on YouTube Live. One of the benefits of YouTube Live is that you can actually watch this on your smart device. If you go to your YouTube, your YouTube icon on your smart TV, you can search Sewer Park Audubon Center and find us there and sit back and relax while you take in the event. Good so evening. We go ahead and um, begin we'd like with to our land acknowledgement. We present to you Ed Dominguez. Good evening. We'd like to honor the original human inhabitants of this area that we call home, the Coast Salish peoples, the original naturalists, caretakers, and conservationists. And since I'm speaking to you from Seward Park, a peninsula on Lake Washington, I want to especially acknowledge the people that inhabited the lake who referred to themselves as the Hachu Abish. We acknowledge and respect their caring for the land and their presence here, past, present, and future. Thank you. That was Ed Dominguez. He's the lead naturalist at Sewer Park Audubon. I'm Joey Manson. I'm the center director at Sewer Park Audubon Center. And I wanna welcome you all to this wonderful presentation that we have tonight. You know, one of the reasons why we started is because being in the park many times a week, Ed and I hear a lot of questions and hear um, comments about uh, coyote activity, coyote sightings, and coyote encounters. And as those things rate, uh, raise up more and more on a mostly daily basis, we felt we really like to talk about what the impact of coyotes is on our communities, both inside and outside the park. 
We reached out to Katie Remind, who works for the Woodland Park Zoo, and she helps lead the Urban Coyote Project here in Seattle. Katie was um, outstanding in putting together a panel of people who are experts, who are studying and witnessing and, and, and communicating about the role that coyotes and other wildlife play in our ecosystem. So what you see before you is gonna be the amassed collection of those people bringing their, their experience and their intelligence to this uh, committee. And at this point, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the program just in general before I turn it over to Katie. At the end of the program, there will be a question and answer period. Uh, in your chat box on YouTube, you'll see that there's an uh, area over there where you can place your questions. Put your questions there at any time during the program. And at the end of the program, we'll go through those questions and pose them to the person who might be more apt to answer those program. We will be able to watch this, um, watch this presentation later on on the uh, Sewer Park Audubon Center Rewind page or on the YouTube page that is for Sewer Park Audubon Center. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Remind. And I'll see you all pretty much at the end of the program when we get to the question and answer. Have a great one. Thanks so much, Joey. And, and thank you to Stewart Park Audubon Center for hosting all of us today. I'm Katie Remine. I'm the Living Northwest Conservation Manager with Woodland Park Zoo. And we're so excited to have you all join us today. I'm gonna do a quick introduction of everyone who's here today and then we'll jump right in. So, and I'll, I'll introduce folks in the order that they're gonna present. So we have Sam Kraling, who's a University of Washington PhD student and lead of the Seattle Coyote Study. And we have Mark Jordan, who is a, an associate professor in the Department of Biology at Seattle University and one of the co-leads of our Seattle Urban Carnivore Project. We have Robert Long, also with Woodland Park Zoo, who's the Living Northwest Program Director and also a co-lead of the Seattle Urban Carnivore Project. And Ed Dominguez, who you heard from, who is lead naturalist with Seward Park Audubon Center. We also have Janice Clark joining us. Janice is a Seward Park area community member. And finally, Chris Anderson, who's a wildlife biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we will get started with Sam. Hi everyone, so I'm Sam, I use she, her pronouns. As Katie said, I'm a UW PhD student um, and proud Berkeley alum, um, and I run the Seattle Coyote Study. Oh. There we go, okay. So what you've probably heard about coyotes is predominantly negative from the media. So coyote attacks terrifying neighbors, um, wildlife officials warn of coyote attacks, beloved pet killed by coyote, coyote attacks Carolina girl. And while all these things do happen, they are actually relatively rare. And coyotes can actually have really beneficial um, effects for us and the ecosystems that we live in. And beyond that, they're kind of just doing their own thing. They're not here to be villainized. They're just kind of living their lives just like you and I. Um, so to begin with, I thought we would talk about what actually is a coyote. Um, so they're relatively small, especially on the West Coast. They're about 20 to 30 pounds. To put that in perspective, I have a golden retriever that's 75 pounds. So that's really just like a third of your average large dog. They're pretty small. Um, they are in the dog family though. They're actually close enough that they can interbreed. They're omnivorous. So many people think of them as these carnivores only eating meat, but that's not really true. They actually eat a lot of fruits and different insects as well. Um, and they're also ubiquitous across the United States. So you can find them in really wildland areas like Yellowstone National Park or in really urbanized areas like Seattle and Los Angeles. Um, and they're pretty much everywhere now. And we'll talk about that in a second. And why would we care about coyotes? So for one, they're really important to our ecosystems. They have kind of filled this role of an apex predator. Um, and they're really good at kind of controlling these pest um, populations that we have within our city. Um, they're also one of the only species that are really thriving during this Anthropocene era that we live in. While many species are not able to cope with this kind of habitat degradation that has come along with human development, coyotes have really thrived and have even expanded across the United States and into Latin America. Um, and they're also here. They're really hard to get rid of, so we might as well learn to kind of coexist with them. Uh, go forward. All right, so this kind of gif on the right here, I'm sorry, the left here is kind of showing the, the range of coyotes expanding. It's important to note that 
we didn't move these coyotes anywhere. They're actually kind of naturally expanding their own range on their own. Um, as we kind of extirpated wolves and removed them from the landscape, this allowed coyotes to kind of fill those niches, those voids that are left um, in the wake of the absence of wolves. And they're also really good at kind of using this human development. So the land that we've changed kind of alters it so that the, the habitat is um, available to them and they can exploit these resources that, we, that we've that um, we made available to them. Um, urban coyotes in, uh, in particular are kind of unique. They typically are bolder than these rural individuals and it's heritable. So their pups from these kind of bolder individuals are also typically bolder. Um, why is this um, they have a more varied diet, so we might expect them to eat a little bit more. In part, this is because in our urban ecosystems, we just have a higher variety of prey items. So you can think of your compost or your trash. We have all these invasive species that have been introduced into the city. Um, and there's also lots of ornamental plants that we, that we have around the city, like plums and apples that they have access to. Um, and they're also behaviorally plastic. So this means that they're able to adapt to a lot of different scenarios and able to kind of change their behavior to um, better suit their needs. They have much smaller territories and they also live at much higher densities than you would find in rural areas. Coyotes in Seattle specifically have been here probably since the 50s, the 30s. There's a little bit of um, debate around what the date is, but they've been here for quite a while. Um, they can be found in most green spaces across the city. Um, they're likely not increasing in population. So you'll hear people say that as the rabbit population has boomed, coyote populations might have increased as well. That's probably not super true because there's a lot of food besides rabbits that are here and they're probably more space limited than kind of um, resource limited. Um, and they can actually really help us control pest populations and things like diseases. So they can be really beneficial to us. And then we're gonna walk through kind of what a year in the life of a coyote family would be um, in Seattle specifically. So we're gonna start off with mom and dad, they're monogamous. Um, so they're only going to be with each other unless one of, something happens to their mate. Um, they den in late spring. They typically have four to seven pups, but this can be up to 11, so they can have a lot more. Um, let's see, they have a high level of parental investment, so they care about their kids a lot, just like you and I, um, and they're also really fiercely protective of their children. So one of the things that we'll talk about is how coyotes might perceive things like you or I or, their, or your dogs, and how that might affect their behavior, especially when they're denning. Um, these are some really cute coyote pups, but um, when they're in the den, they'll stay there for about six weeks. Um, coyotes in urban areas can kind of den anywhere under fallen trees in kind of culverts under streets. So they can be all over the place. Um, uh, typically these pups are gonna disperse in six to nine months and these parents are being empty nesters and get ready to rear their next litter. Um, and then after this time period during the fall and winter, these pups are gonna disperse out and find their own territories, their own homes and their own mates and kind of repeat this cycle. As you can imagine, if you have this many pups, that means you have a lot of mouths to feed. Um, in order to feed those, um, all those mouths, um, coyotes are really adaptable. They'll use kind of any resource that's available to them. Um, what a lot of studies have found and what my study seems to preliminarily be finding is that um, these coyotes are eating lots of fruits, lots of rodents like rats and mice, and lots of rabbits. Um, they do occasionally eat domestic animals, but there are many ways to prevent this, things like keeping cats and dogs inside and on leashes. Um, and most studies, excepting um, one in Los Angeles, have found that domestic animals really make up a very low percentage of their diet, usually about one to 2%, so not, not too frequent of an occurrence. Um, they do live in family groups, so they typically have mom and dad and then the pups of that year before they disperse, and they don't usually tolerate outsiders in their territory or even pups from years previously. So basically, once they become of age, they get kicked out and mom and dad rear their next litter. Um, they can also be solitary, so if it's advantageous to them, individuals can kind of roam in a larger territory and um, not live in that kind of family pack structure. Um, one of the reasons that why this matters is because if you remove coyotes, so if you lethally remove them, kill them, what happens is you feel, you create this void that other coyotes can kind of just rush into. And when you uh, remove coyotes, you kind of have this, this, empty, um, this empty void of these resources that other coyotes can kind of take advantage of, and it can actually lead to higher birth rates. So those, those kind of empty spaces are going to be filled even faster. And so that's kind of why 
there never really could be a city without, without coyotes in our future because they're just gonna keep filling that void. Um, like I said earlier, um, they're really protective of their family. Um, domestic dogs are really closely related. And you can imagine if you are a coyote, you kind of look like a dog, you're in the same family, you might perceive these domestic dogs as a threat to their, to their own family. Um, what typically happens around denning time is coyotes will kind of escort animals and other people away from their den. This typically looks like them following us. This is a really natural and actually not concerning behavior. It's simply them making sure that you stay away from their den site. Um, but typically this doesn't lead to any aggression and it's just them making sure that, you know, you are a safe distance away from their kids. Um, most of the time when we do see kind of this influx of conflicts, it's during this denning season, so between April and June. And that's again, just because they're very protective of their young um, and they can see these kind of dogs and humans as potentially um, something that might be a problem for their kids. But this again, it doesn't usually lead to aggressive behavior. This doesn't usually lead to biting or anything like that. Um, you may see behaviors like this escorting or following behavior. You might hear them bark and kind of these alarm barks that tell you that you might be getting too close. And then occasionally if dogs are off leash, especially, they might chase these dogs off and away from their den just to make sure that their, their pups are safe. Um, so like I said, these kind of non-concerning behaviors um, include these kind of escorting and barking and chasing off leash dogs. Where you get uh, transition into kind of this more concerning behavior is when the coyotes are actively attacking pets that are on leash. So not just following pets, but actively biting them. Um, if they're touching people or approaching within really close distances and they don't seem to respond to any hazing or yelling or throwing things at them that would attempt to kind of scare them away, that's concerning. If they're actually biting humans, of course, that is concerning. And if you see this kind of begging behavior where they look like they're kind of waiting for handouts, that's usually a sign that they've been fed in the past and that can lead to some really concerning behavior. Um, so why, do, why does concerning behavior actually happen? Uh, oftentimes this is individually based, so it's not usually these whole family groups, but individuals often become emboldened after being fed or habituated. So when we feed coyotes, they kind of, they get used to our presence, they lose their fear of us, and then they might kind of be less wary and more likely to come up to people. If they're being hand fed especially, they might be you know, more likely to kind of nip um, so what we really want to do is to avoid, you know, feeding coyotes and wildlife in general. This leads to a lot of concerning behavior and potential conflicts. And it's one of the easiest ways to avoid conflicts is just to make sure that these animals are not being fed either directly or indirectly. So things like keeping compost and trash covered up can be really helpful because we don't want to have those attractants in order to make sure that these coyotes still have this fear of us. Um, and people are often really concerned about these attacks. I started this presentation saying that, yes, they do happen, but they are relatively rare. Um, and just how rare are we talking here? So between 1977 and 2015, there were only 367 coyote attacks in the US that had been reported. And so this study kind of looked at across the United States, most of these happened in California. Um, an attack was kind of uh, defined as an actual bite of that would happen. Um, in comparison, every year in the US, 4.7 million people are bitten by domestic dogs. So that's a chance of one in 70. So you're way more likely to have a problem with a domestic dog than you are with a coyote. Um, and of course, people wanna know about our pets. So very few studies have actually looked at this, but one study specifically in Chicago found that across an entire year, there was about 15 attacks on pets. So it does happen, but it's not as common as the media would have you believe. And so to transition into kind of talking about my study, the Seattle Coyote study, um, I use non-invasive genetics. This means that I don't have to touch or see the animals at all. I actually use their scat. So if you look on the left, these photos are actually from Seward Park. On the top, we've got kind of that left brown scat is from a dog, but right next to that very uh, that little gray scat is coyote. Um, that's kind of a typical them eating vertebrates. It's full of hair and bones. On the bottom, we see kind of a, a little bit of a different shape scat. This is still coyote, but instead of eating other mammals, this coyote was eating salmon berries. So they eat lots of fruits during the summer. What my study kind of looks at um, is we take urban scats from coyotes and rural scats from northeastern Washington. We collect the DNA from these scats and we'll start with kind of the diet portion of this. 
but we use this next generation sequencing technique called meta barcoding in order to figure out exactly what prey items they eat. How this works is you kind of pick up the prey DNA within, um, within these scats and we're able to use these kind of reference databases to understand exactly what species are represented within that sample and thereby understand exactly what coyotes were eating. And it's through this kind of predation that we can actually derive a benefit from coyotes. So in Seattle especially, we have lots of invasive species. So things like these Eastern cottontail rabbits, black and uh, Norway rats, these things are in our ecosystem, but they're not native to here. Um, and they also kind of have these detrimental effects. So not only are they kind of, you know, messing with our native vegetation, they are able to spread diseases, they destroy infrastructure. Um, and when you introduce coyotes on the landscape, they can kind of eat a lot of these pest animals. Um, and that can have a direct benefit for us by reducing kind of this disease transmission and the potential for infrastructure destruction from these, um, from these invasive species. On the other hand, coyotes do eat a lot of fruit, including native fruits like salmon berries and thimble berries. Um, and Seattle has a lot of active restoration projects going on. So these coyotes could potentially help us restore our forests by eating these native seeds um, kind of helping the, the seeds germinate through that gut passage and then spreading the seeds as they run around our, our city. Um, and all these things together can kind of have this direct monetary benefit for us. So part of my study is looking at quantifying just how much coyotes can benefit us monetarily. Coyotes can also help us control disease on a landscape directly. So this is a, a quick example from my lab mate, Yasmin Hentati, who is also a grad student at um, UW. Um, so this quick example here, so Toxoplasmosis gondii is, a, is a, um, a disease that we don't necessarily want. It's for people who aren't immunocompromised, it typically doesn't have a big effect, but if you are immunocompromised and if you're pregnant, this can actually have very strong effects on your immune system. Um, what happens is it's shed by cats. So both wild and domestic cats can shed this protist. I think it's a protist. Um, and these oocytes, these kind of cyst-like egg things, they get washed into our waterways and they can um, infect our marine mammals. And so in California, we've seen a pretty large die off of sea otters because of these cysts getting into our, our otters and kind of um, uh, deteriorating them. But when we have coyotes on a landscape, what can happen is they can um, help control this by not only removing these kind of feral cats and some of these rodents that carry these um, this disease, um, but instead of these oocytes kind of washing away from feces, what happens is they actually get stored in muscle tissue and they become inert. So they no longer can trans um, transmit through the environment. And in that way, coyotes kind of, kind of help us control the spread of this disease and a couple other diseases as well. Um, on the other side of my study is looking at kind of these population genetics. So not only can we tell that a coyote is pooping these poops, we can tell exactly which coyote is making these, these scats. Um, and we can make sure, and we can do things like create a population estimate, which can help us in a couple ways. And my study aims to look at a couple different things. So what I didn't mention, um, besides Seattle as a study area, I also look at Mercer Island, Bainbridge Island, and Vashon Island. Um, and we are, we're asking a couple different questions, like do urban centers act like genetic islands? So um, islands typically have lower gene flow, which can have some Kind of detrimental effects or evolutionary effects on wildlife. So we're wondering if um, Seattle and other cities with these kind of really dense waterways around us and these, these, um, these large traffic highways through them could act potentially as these genetic islands. Uh, we're also asking questions like how many coyotes are there? Simply what is the population size because it's unknown? How many males? How many females? What are the demographics of this population? Uh, we're trying to figure out who is eating what um, if we have problem coyotes specifically that are targeting things that we maybe don't want them to eat, that can be important information. And then how um, does them eating things on the landscape affect us? So um, going back to that idea of them eating species that we don't want on our landscape or helping us spread seeds, et cetera. Um, and then wondering how genes kind of flow through this landscape can not only help us understand the health of our coyote population, but can also help us understand how other wildlife species in urban areas can function. And to get kind of specific on our Seward Park coyotes here, 
Um, we know from genetics and also um, observations from people like Ed that the pair had five pups this season. There were three male pups and two females. Um, from genetics, I determined that a couple of the, the adults in this, or I guess the, the male of this pack, um, does spend time in Seward Park, Genesee, and Leshy Park, so all up the west, sorry, east side of Seattle in that area. And in summers, they are eating lots of fruit, and in winters, they typically eat a few more vertebrates, which makes sense because there's just less fruit on the landscape during these winter times. And if we look a little bit more close, oops, sorry, if we look a little bit more closely at the genetics here, um, this is kind of what I get back when we run some of the genetics on these individuals. This can tell us the, the, um, what sex our animals are. It can also tell us some proxy for genetic diversity. And if you look at these two individuals with these red boxes, those are actually the mom and dad of our pair here. And so we can figure that out through looking at these numbers and how they're, um, how they're inherited. Um, that's it for me, um, but I will pass it over to Katie. Great, thanks so much, Sam. Um, we're gonna move on to another research project now, the Seattle Urban Carnivore Project, and I will pass it along to Mark Jordan. Great, thanks, Katie, and thanks so much, Sam, for that background on coyotes in urban areas. Uh, I'm gonna give a little background on the Seattle Urban Carnivore Project, and I'll be joined by the collaborators on this project, Katie and Robert, to give you an overview of our Urban Carnivore Project. So this was a project started in 2018. And it's a collaboration between Woodland Park Zoo and Seattle University. And we have four big goals associated with it. Uh, first off is to understand the wildlife we have living in the area. Uh, we also are collaborating with people who are doing similar studies outside of Seattle. We want to engage the community and we really want to emphasize ways that we can coexist with these species. So we have a handful of focal species that we are emphasizing. So tonight we're talking about coyotes, but our project also looks at the other mammalian predators we find in the area like black bears, cougars, and raccoons. Um, but for tonight, I'm going to talk mostly about some of our results with coyotes. So our first big goal is understanding urban carnivores. And as you I saw from Sam's presentation, there are changes in the ways that these species behave when you get into urban areas, but we really don't know much about the impacts of urbanization on some of these species that can be really well adapted to urban areas. So some of our preliminary results are showing that as you move closer into the city, you start to lose certain species, like first the cougars disappear, then the black bears, then the bobcats, and some like raccoons start to increase. And I'll leave it as a bit of a cliffhanger what happens with coyotes, but I'll talk about that with some of our data in a bit. Our primary method for studying these species has been camera trapping. So we set out cameras in the woods, they're automatically triggered by movement. So anytime any of these species walks by one of our cameras that are set in parks all the way from Seattle out to the foothills of the Cascades, we get photos of them and can document that they're in that area. Here you see a map of all of the sites where we have cam set cameras out. And this is based on a protocol um, built by the Urban Wildlife Information Network. They're based out of Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. And this is a big multi-city collaboration. There are now over 50 cities from places as far away as Cape Town, South Africa, and a lot of cities uh, across North America. And all of those green dots are camera traps set along two transects that are designed to run from the most urban parts of the city all the way out to some of the less urban areas in the foothills of the Cascades. And then we've added in some spots of infill in areas that are of particular interest because community groups have wanted to get involved with the project as well. And we feed then all of our results from these transects in this study into this big worldwide network. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll take it from there uh, before I pass it back to Robert. So another goal of our project, as Mark mentioned, is engaging community members in our research. And so with those camera traps, we have, you know, somewhere around 40 to 45 camera traps um, out and running each month. And most of them run year round. And so we have teams of amazing volunteers uh, that we train each year and they go out each month and help us to check on these camera traps. 
This includes folks like, like these folks here who are actually zoo staff who are volunteering for the project so that they get a chance to get out and experience conservation in the field, but also community members and community groups from, from all across the region. This year we have 120 volunteers who've joined our project in the Seattle area out into Kirkland, Bellevue, Issaquah, and also over on Bainbridge Island. Another way that we get data and also engage community members is with our carnivore spotter tool, um, which is a, a website that you can use on your phone or on your computer um, to share your sightings of urban carnivores. You can share a sighting with a photograph or a video, or even if you didn't, didn't manage to get one, sometimes you don't get that photo, but you can share your sightings with us at carnivorespotter.org and they become data that are, are part of our project. We've been doing, had this up since August, 2019, and we have over 7,400 observations and still building. And thank you all for sharing your observations. It's really, really helpful and interesting data for our project. The photos are also really fun to explore. You can go on the website and explore and filter in different ways. And these are just a sampling of some of the great photos that have been submitted to Carnivore Spotter and become part of the data for our project. And as Mark mentioned, ultimately the research that we're doing, the questions we're asking and the data that we're looking at, we hope will help us coexist with urban carnivores in our region. We have worked with communities such as the city of Issaquah and community volunteers in Issaquah to develop some tools um, to help with coexistence, such as these yard signs and a social media toolkit. And that's why we're here tonight. We're really excited to be part of this, this panel and be part of this group of people really thinking about um, using great information like Sam's research and our research to think about how we can coexist with wildlife. And I will pass it along to Robert. Thanks, Katie. I get to talk about some really fun results that we've gotten from our camera trapping efforts and our volunteer teams. Um, lots of coyote photos, as you might guess. Um, Images of coyotes um, hunting, as you see here. Images of coyotes taking naps, um, sometimes right in front of the camera, so not too bothered by that, by that presence. And then interesting images about coyote um, predation or um, diet feeding behavior, like Sam talked about and what she's studying, but you see a coyote here with a, with a cottontail in its mouth. And then this is an image we got, a series of images actually of an interaction between a coyote and a raccoon at one of our camera stations. And um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of Sam's research, but um, our understanding is that coyotes don't typically uh, target raccoons, but they do interact of course. And from everything we can tell from these images, the raccoon made it away safely. So when you take all those images together and you start to look at patterns in the data, it gets really interesting. So we can look at detections of different species throughout the year. And here you see a whole list of some of our um, target carnivores and even species like deer. But at the top, you'll see coyotes being a little more detected through the, the uh, spring and summer months um, and, and many of the other species dropping off a little in the winter. Um, and then if we look a little closer, in terms of day um, activity periods, it, it tells a really interesting picture. Um, you see coyotes in the top there in that olive green. Many people think coyotes are mostly nocturnal, but actually they're, they're pretty active throughout the day, any time of the day really. And you can see that in that graph where you have activity periods where if you contrast it with, for example, a Virginia opossum at the very bottom, you can see almost no activity during daylight or um, daytime hours, and, and they're pretty much a nocturnal species. So these are the types of information and data we're, we're able to get from these camera images and from the Carnivore Spotter website. So Robert shared with you some of the when of the data that we've looked at, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the where. So we actually have built a habitat model to look at what factors affect coyote presence. We've got cameras all over the region, and we wanted to know, well, what are some of the factors that affect getting a coyote at this camera, but not at this camera? And some of the things we looked at included the amount of impervious surface nearby. That's just a shorthand for urbanization because impervious surfaces are things like roads, cement, roofs, those sorts of things. Anything water is going to run off of. 
as well as the total length of roads near our camera sites, assuming that in more densely urban areas, you're going to get more total road near any camera site. And then we also looked at some census data, including human population density, as well as income and the proportion of non-white residents, because there's some other research that we've participated in that have shown that um, income and social status have an impact on the biodiversity in certain neighborhoods. And here's our results. So the thing with really the strongest signal was impervious surface, but looking across this, what this says is that the prediction of coyote occupancy, that is the probability that any given site will have a coyote in it, is about 50%. And as you increase impervious surface, that is as you get more urban, it stays at 50%. So it is essentially a coin flip, whether or not you're going to get a coyote, no matter where you are in the urban area. So one thing we want to do is also blend these two sources of data we've got, the camera traps on the left with our carnivore spotter data, um, as we have on the right. And so this next map will show you a couple things. Um, so first off, I want to refer back to what Sam was saying, and she said that coyotes are adaptable or behaviorally plastic. And this figure just screams behaviorally plastic to me, because what this says is that no matter where you are in King, Pierce, or Snohomish County, based on this model, there's roughly a 50% chance that you might find a coyote and that there's no real variation across that landscape. What it also shows us is those pink dots are everywhere where we've received a carnivore spotter report of coyotes. So you can see that there are certain clusters around North Seattle and certain areas east of the lake. And given the fact that our map suggests there should be coyotes most everywhere at about a 50% probability, but we're not getting pink dots everywhere, that actually shows us some cold spots on our map where we're not getting as many people reporting. So if you're watching this presentation from one of those spots that doesn't have a pink dot in it, I strongly encourage you to uh, round up your good carnivore sightings and report them at carnivorespotter.org. And uh, that wraps up our section of the presentation. So we'll pass it off now back to Katie. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Robert. And now we're going to move on to some stories about the Seward Park coyotes with Ed and Janice. So we've heard some great information regarding our coyotes and statistics and information about where they are and what they do. Now, take a look into the eyes of this coyote. First of all, you'll probably notice they're beautiful. But can you tell looking at this coyote, how good is your read of body language of animals? Looking at the face and the body posturing and the eyes of the coyote, what would you say this coyote's body language is telling you right now? If you thought curiosity, you're right. The coyote's ears are forward, eyes are looking ahead, the coyote's curious at the photographer, me taking this picture. And as the lead naturalist at Seward Park Audubon, um, I've had an opportunity to encounter uh, particularly our female coyote, our mama coyote, um, for the last four years since she first made her appearance at the park. And as Sam pointed out, last year she gave birth to five pups and I got to see all five at one point and they were just beautiful. You know, many people come to Seward Park because it really is an oasis of natural beauty in the middle of an ur urban environment. It's the only location in the metropolitan Seattle area that has old growth forest that has never been logged, either, either by the old two-man crosscut saws or chainsaws. So people come there to connect with getting away from the urban environment and concrete and be out in the realm of trees that are approaching 500 years old. And in that realm of trees are all the birds and animals that make their home there, including mama coyote. And as soon as we get, there we go. And mama coyote moves across both the forest and the meadow. And imagine for a moment, that as you're taking a walk through Seward Park, 
admiring the trees and feeling just the, the smelling the nature and feeling the environment, you get a glimpse of her running across the, the meadow or through the forest, or you hear her give a bark or a howl. The sense of connectivity that you feel to the natural world is, is just very powerful. And many people that I've talked to when they've had the opportunity to see or hear Mama Coyote or some of the pups, it gives them a real sense of groundedness, of connectivity, and of being a part of the natural world. And that, that sense of connectivity is good for the health of, for us as human beings. And what the coyotes ask from us isn't much. They're very good. I've watched Mama Coyote many times move her, make her way through the park. She is so adept at moving through even heavily trafficked areas. On a busy Saturday afternoon, sunny summer afternoon in the park, people biking, walking, talking, Mama Coyote will just move right through at just the right pace, not too fast to draw attention to herself, not too slow that people notice her. And I've seen her move right through a crowd of people and move up on into the forest. And most people don't even know that she's passed through. So the coyotes don't ask much from us. And in fact, as Sam alluded to earlier, these animals have evolved over thousands of years to make a life with a minimum of conflict with other animals. They wanna go about their business, take care of their daily needs, raise their young, and not have interactions that are harmful to them or others. Because think about it, if a mama coyote gets injured, she can't go to a doctor, unlike our domestic dogs that come and get a good meal morning and night and can curl up by the hearth or on their bed in the evening, mama coyotes out in the woods. There's no vet to go to if she gets injured. And I've seen a wounded coyote last summer walking with one paw, uh, severely injured, and then she recovered. So they're out there on their own. They don't ask much from us other than to allow, allow them to conduct their lives as they would like. If we can get our slide to advance here. There we go. This is our mama coyote. And when she's in the park, she's keenly aware of everything that's around her. Human beings, dogs on leash, dogs off leash, and is very adept at making sure that she keeps herself safe. But even when I've seen off leash dogs approach her quite closely, and with body language that shows that they're quite intent in moving into her personal space. She has not acted aggressively. She's maintained her ground. She's kept her ears up. She's barked, sending, sending a verbal message to the dog that you're getting a little too close. This is my space. Please respect it. And when the dog finally draws a line and doesn't get any closer, Mama Coyote will turn and move in the opposite direction. So. She's very, very good at understanding that her role in the ecosystem and wants no part of conflicts with humans or their dogs. So again, the coyotes don't ask much. They just want to be able to go about their lives and take care of their business in peace and in solitude. And to give you a sense of what it's like, here's Mama Coyote maneuvering right through Seward Park, giving some vocalizations. <laughs> So you can she, see she was using her sense of smell, as all canids have a very strong sense of smell, probably smelling dogs and their scents that have moved through the area on this trail heading down the Lost Lake Trail, and is very curious and very aware of everything that's going on around here, as well as from my, from my perspective, being an incredibly beautiful animal. So our Seward Park coyotes, something to treasure. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over uh, to a Jan and she can tell us a little bit more about her personal experiences with the coyotes. 
Oh, thank you, Ed. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Janice Clark, and I'd like to briefly share my personal experiences, concerns, and opinions about living with urban coyotes in the Seward Park area. I'm a 34-year resident of the neighborhood. The park's three blocks from my house, and I'm there three to six times a week, depending on my work schedule as an RN. Some of the photos of, coy of my coy coyote photos are shared with you in the slideshow. My experience with the local coyotes over a very long period of time has never been one of fear. I've watched them in the park and neighborhood running around, lazing about, peacefully living their lives and fearful of humans. I don't seem to see them every day or even every week, but I have had many close encounters over the years, meaning for me less than 10 feet away with my dog on leash barking at them. I have been escorted around the park many times by coyotes. Most of the time though, I've seen them lying around resting. Some of my favorite personal photos document this. Not once did a coyote act aggressively toward me or my dog or not run away when I haze them if they were too close for my comfort. It's always thrilling to see these beautiful animals and hear them singing at what we call coyote o'clock. I am concerned about the recent killings of coyotes on Mercer Island in February of this year, as reported in the Mercer Island Reporter. It happened in the Laura Hurst neighborhood in 2016, and this was reported by King 5 News. My biggest concern is that could happen in our park or neighborhood in the future. Coyote sightings in our neighborhood elicit mixed responses. Some express exaggerated fears, worries that coyotes could attack their children or lure dogs away and kill them and others respect their right to exist in urban settings and, and enjoy their presence. I try to counter the fearful comments on so, local social media or, or in person by using reliable information provided by the Seattle Urban Carnivore Project and other and local wildlife experts, Ed Dominguez, uh, Joey, and others to hopefully provide accurate information about coyotes uh, the most important information, in my opinion, is how to avoid negative interactions with them. In August of last year, after shotgun shells were found on the main path of Seward Park, I contacted Dr. Long, Long at the Woodland Park Zoo to report my concerns. And then he connected me with Katie, who informed me about this event, and I asked to share my personal experiences as a community member here today. Um, it is my belief that coyotes have the right to exist in our urban settings and that we can peacefully coexist with them. I am hoping this panel can educate the community about urban coyotes, provide specific recommendations and to promote peaceful coexistence and make that the gold standard for um, living with urban coyotes. And uh, thank you for listening to my uh, experiences and my opinions. Thank you so much, Janice, and thank you, Ed, for those stories. That was really fantastic. We're going to get to our last presentation here, um, so we'll call up Chris Anderson. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking some time in your evening to learn about some of our wildlife around us. Uh, plastic Fantastic uh, Coyote here. Let's see. Thanks for fixing that. Something went wrong there. I appreciate it. So anyways, um, yeah, Plastic Fantastic Coyote, as everybody has kind of gotten at, Sam covered it very well. Uh, our coyotes have definitely expanded in North America. They are now all the way down to the Panama Canal, all the way up to Alaska from each coast, from lowlands all the way up through the mountains, over the crest in Washington. And the first the first specimen that's been documented in Western Washington actually did come from King County, Enumclaw in 1937. So it's not surprising actually that, um, you know, we would have uh, supposed coyotes starting to come into the city in the fifties here. So uh, unfortunately I'm having trouble advance my slides. There we go. So, so some things about uh, coyote. Uh, coyote in the state of Washington is unclassified wildlife. And all of this kind of various terms here, the point to take home is unclassified wildlife basically is wildlife that is just in a wild state in Washington. We have no rules governing how to manage them. 
uh, or to actively manage them. You know, things like deer and elk, where we have bag limits and where we um, estimate their populations and do surveys. We unclassified wildlife are wildlife that we do not monitor. Um, we do not estimate their populations. They're just out and existing. So, for example, protected wildlife that would be things like red tail hawk, osprey, even northern flying squirrel. Um, uh, also, uh, our native Douglas squirrel. Uh, the coyote is unclassified, uh, and really, there's nothing that triggers us to do anything to them in this case. So, we really rely on this kind of outreach uh, to get people to understand what you can do and what your really your community can do to help with keeping them wild. Uh, also, recently in the state of Washington, uh, back in 2020, uh, coyote contests were made illegal. Actually, any animal that does not have a bag limit, any wildlife is now illegal to have any hunting contest on. So uh, that used to be somewhat of a historic uh, thing with coyotes and some, um, you know, folks in, in, in the United States. Uh, and uh, it's something that, um, you know, the department and our constituents uh, basically told us that we needed to get away from. So there's a coyote in the backyard here, a little ravine uh, behind a house, a uh, dog leash um, hanging right there to go walk the dog at an appropriate time. Uh, so, you know, uh, in talking with both my, my own personal experiences and folks that have been into the apartment currently or uh, uh, retired, um, we really started to get a ramp in our region four office, which is King County, uh, this side of the crest and this side of Puget Sound all the way to Canada here. Um, in the 90s with the dot-com boom. Uh, and then uh, particularly in uh, the 21st century, uh, that, that trend just continued and has just leveled off now as far as we just get these regular uh, calls uh, of people basically saying the same thing uh, cyclic, in a cyclic manner. Uh, and in a lot of, a lot of areas that uh, we've heard it before, uh, places like Shoreline, Bellevue, Seattle, you know, Mark and uh, Sam had mentioned like North Seattle, West Seattle, uh, you name it, these coyotes are everywhere. And it just kind of depends on if you've seen them before, or you're new to the neighborhood, and some people just don't realize that they've been around, which is actually in some cases, if you, you know, you haven't seen them before, and they're doing the right thing, that's what we want. You know, you see an animal dips out of a, uh, out of the uh, brush uh, at your neighborhood park and goes back in, that's good. That's the behavior we want. So um, as we've kind of got it, and we'll talk about some techniques later here in our talk, um, you know, and Sam had mentioned that removing uh, wildlife, not just coyotes, can open up uh, areas for uh, other, uh, you know, brothers and sisters of this same common species, uh, you know, and then with coyotes, that's actually been proven in science uh, and a lot of other common wildlife too. Uh, it's a temporary solution. You know, these animals have develop this habituated uh, behavior and patterns. And that is due to um, basically humans offering situations that allow them to lose their fear of us and become habituated to situations that we don't want them to be. And uh, then that creates some, some concern and strife with people, uh, but there's easy ways to avoid that in the long term. Relocation of wildlife in the state of Washington is illegal. Uh, you have to have a permit, it's generally research, research oriented. Uh, and it's not very effective, particularly with these common species. Think about taking a crow, moving it all the way over to the Okanagan thing. I mean, they're, they're common. They're, this, these things are all over the place. You haven't gotten rid of the crow population. You haven't gotten rid of the coyote population either. They're here. They're not, they're not going away. So uh, the thing about these human condition widespread animals, um, you know, this, this is the thing that we, you know, preach to people. Uh, is that, uh, you know, you take them somewhere and let them loose, they're usually going to get into it with someone of their own species. And uh, that's very inhumane for them as well. They don't know what's going on. They don't know where we're at. And you've got territorial animals that do know what's going on. I always tell people that if you're a college student and you came home to your apartment and there was a freshman on your couch saying, here I am, you probably wouldn't be very happy. So the big thing is thinking about this long term and embracing these animals. They're here to stay. Coyote, raccoons, black bear in suburban areas here, uh, and really the entire community coming together, learning these techniques and uh, taking action long-term, helping people out and uh, you know, putting in these uh, conflict reduction techniques and exclusionary techniques that we'll get into a little later here. 
As far as the department goes, you can call us. Uh, we have self-help uh, on our website as well. Uh, with other wildlife, not as much coyote. Again, I mentioned coyotes, unclassified wildlife, and also due to some trapping laws here uh, and other things, uh, there's really not much that people can do for coyotes. So you're looking at these coexistent techniques or getting someone like USDA Wildlife Services to come out, evaluate the, the situation. And then really it's either, you know, hey guys, you gotta live with this, which is always what is preached, or hey, in their case, they have the authority to go in and um, lethally remove an animal. No one wants that done. And that's the thing we're talking about tonight is how can we avoid that? Also, if you have a sick animal, like the injured coyote or something like that, calling local rehabbers. So the website that we have here is the Living with Wildlife website. There's a lot of these other things I've talked about as well, injured or orphan and whatnot. Uh, how you can, you know, various techniques here at the species fact sheets. So exclusionary techniques, uh, hazing, habitual, how to avoid habituation, et cetera. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass this on to our uh, panel now. Uh, these are my contacts. Thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate you sharing all that. So at this point, we're gonna move into, we're gonna do a little round robin here. Um, and ev every one of the panelists is going to get to share their favorite tip for coexisting with urban coyotes. So I'll call on each person and we can each share our favorite tip um, as our, our uh, uh, offering to you all here joining us tonight. So Janice, you're up first. Well, the big one for me, because I do have a dog and I do live close to Seward Park and I love the coyotes and I love my dog, is to keep your dogs on leash. And it's a huge problem at Seward Park. Um, Ed, Joey, uh, Gail Johnson, longtime uh, Seattle Parks employee, I mean, we all see what a problem it is. And um, actually, I'm more concerned about domestic dogs off leash towards my dog than any coyote. So please keep your dogs on leash. And it really, it's, it's very difficult to enforce that law because it's a big park and there's so few um, animal control uh, people around and, the, you know, and, and, but it's completely disregarded uh, down at the park. So that's, that's the big tip that I would pass on. Thanks so much, Janice. And Ed is up next. Yes. If you're visiting Seward Park or wherever you may be, be aware that anything you drop or spill can become potential food or items of interest for our coyotes. Um, as Chris uh, mentioned, and I so appreciate, animals can become habituated to things that are of human nature and spillage of food, um, debris that doesn't quite make it into the garbage can intentionally or otherwise can end up being an attractant uh, for coyotes that wanna come and investigate with that great nose that they have. And if they get a taste of something and it's good, they may want more of it. So keeping animals from being habituated is very important and it's easy to do. Around Seward Park, there are gray garbage can receptacles everywhere, as well as big square blue recycle bins. If you're at Seward Park and you're eating and drinking, make sure that everything that is that is garbage or recyclable gets into a container that's appropriate and try not to spill food debris on the ground. If you do, pick it up and dispose of it so it doesn't become an attractant for the animals. Um, that's one of the best ways that we can keep the, the coyotes, which as I pointed out, they're doing their thing, they're living their coyote lives, they don't want to interact with us, and if we let them go about that business, it's going to be healthier for them and healthier for us. So be aware of when you're eating, drinking, everything gets disposed of correctly, and if there's spillage, clean it up. And as um, uh, Sam pointed out so well, the studies in California show that 46% of uh, coyotes diet or rodents, 28% is our fruits. Um, they're very good at finding their own food. Um, let's make sure they don't get anything they shouldn't be getting from us. Great, thanks for that, Ed. And I'll pass it to Sam. 
So my tip is keeping your cats indoors. Now I know you might think it can be advantageous for your cat to go explore outside, but there are ways to kind of entertain them inside, playing with them, things like that. They can give them that same stimulation. On top of this, cats are actually responsible for over 40 extinctions across the world and are some of the main threats to birds in the United States. They're also really good at spreading diseases like toxoplasmosis. Um, and in general, it's just safer for your cat, right? I've seen more dead cats hit by cars than eaten by coyotes in this city. So keeping your cats indoors can be a really good way to make sure that your pets don't come into conflict with coyotes. Great. Thanks, Sam. I also love those catios. It's also really fun for your neighbors because it's like you can go by the catio and see if the cat's outside in the morning in their catio. All right, Mark. So my tip is very similar to Ed's. He talked about removing attractants in the park, and it's also about removing attractants around your house. So making sure that your garbage and compost are well secured, not leaving pet food out because pet food is just going to be an amazing attractant for anything like a raccoon or a coyote to come into your yard. And part of this is you just don't want them kind of getting in your business. But also, as Sam mentioned during her presentation, this idea of habituation is a big issue. And if they get habituated to getting food from you, then that's when we move from coexistence into conflict and you get um, some serious problems potentially with the animals. Um, now, if you're like me and you have a bird feeder, there are some things you can do to keep your bird seed from attracting animals like rodents that will attract the coyotes, doing things like using a spicy suet that mammals don't like, but birds don't seem to mind, and also trying to catch any of the seeds that are falling out of your bird feeder. And it can be as simple as the janky little pie plate I have hanging underneath my bird feeder. That works pretty well. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, and my tip kind of follows along from that. Um, you know, we know that Seattle is can be a pretty ratty, ratty city. Um, but if you reduce attractants and also um, put exclusions uh, around areas of your home so that rodents can't get in your attic or your crawl space, the reason that can be good for coyotes is because if we use chemicals like rodenticides and then the rodents eat, you know, ingest those chemicals, they, those can get passed up, those toxics can get passed up the food chain to coyotes. And um, there've been a number of studies that have shown the negative impacts that those rodenticides can have on animals such as coyotes and also bobcats, um, anything that might be preying on the rodents in our urban spaces. So my top tip um, for coexistence is to avoid using rodenticides and other chemicals around your, your yard or in your neighborhood. And then passing it on to Robert. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm one of the biggest fans of seeing wildlife in nature. I'm an avid hiker and I love coming across an owl. I love seeing coyotes in the wild um, and, and I like to watch them at a distance, but there's a, a time and a place for what we call humane hazing or gentle hazing. And that's when coyotes are coming a little too close to human spaces. I think it's probably a good idea for people to maybe just clap their hands a couple of times. You could bang on a pot. Really, we want them to get the idea that while we can coexist and it's okay to live around us, we don't want them on our porches where they're likely to maybe come in contact with these food sources that Ed and Mark talked about or possibly get um, our pets riled up and, and, and lead to some sort of conflict or altercation there. So it's okay to watch coyotes if they're up on a hillside in the forest, if, even if they're um, escorting you, there's no need to really um, go crazy and, and start chasing them down the road. But if, they, if they're a little too curious or they're coming into a human yard or a human space, just clap your hands, take a few steps toward them. They, almost every time they'll just run away, so. Great, thanks. And Chris, is there anything that we missed um, that you'd like to add? Well, I think everybody hit stuff really well. One thing though, is to um, really uh, think about if you have outdoor, um, you know, fowl, or in Seattle, we allow for goats, last I understood. Well, when I lived in Seattle, that was the case. I think it's still the case. Um, you know, these animals are carried on a stick. So things that you can do uh, to adequately secure them uh, by either 
paddocking an animal if you have that, not always in a suburban area, but uh, putting up uh, fencing, uh, netting, things like that for the situation you have, ducks, chickens, uh, very important and also important for the other wildlife that may take them as well. I mean, that's going to help them. And those animals then don't get habituated to uh, coming in and taking your chicken, et cetera, and your neighbors and your other neighbors. So. Great. Thanks, everyone. And, and these are things that, you know, you as an individual can do, but it's also these are the things that you can help your neighbors to do. And, and as a lot of us kind of mentioned, it really takes the community working together. So we're really glad to be here today talking with the Seward Park community as well as the broader community that was able to, to join us virtually here today. And I think we're ready to go to our question and answer. So Joey, take us away. All right, well, first of all, um, I, I appreciate everyone's time and I, it was really um, wonderful to you all able to share your, your knowledge, your wisdom, your research and your passion with our audience. I wanna thank you, Sam, Mark, Chris, Robert, Janice and Ed and Katie so much for putting this together. Um, I think we're gonna take away a lot of great information tonight. So as we open with the questions, um, let's see, Bob had two questions directed towards Sam. Uh, let's see. Um, Sam, how do, we, how do we know that the boulder, um, that the boulder, how do we know that they are bolder due to inheritance versus learned behavior from parental modeling? And also, are you tagging or collaring coyotes to allow for future distribution and longitudinal studies? Great questions. So there's been a couple of studies that have looked at kind of these endocrine or hormonal responses to urbanization, kind of human presence. And um, they've done a lot of kind of novel object tests, which is typically how we study the behavior of animals and they're kind of uh, and kind of gauge their level of boldness. So what they one of these studies did is to look at a set of captive coyotes, some that were relatively wild, didn't have any contact with humans, and they exposed them to novel objects as well as kind of human presence. And they looked at the endocrine, endocrinology and this kind of stress response and measured kind of these different levels of boldness and were able to track that that does kind of get inherited down and found a couple of genes that might be kind of related to this. Um, so there probably is also kind of a learned aspect to it, but it does seem like there's kind of this physiological response as well. Um, and then the second question is, is, am I tagging any animals? We're not, we're doing totally non-invasive studies. So I study coyotes, but I've really only seen them like five times, despite how often I'm outside. Um, so I don't even have to see or hear them at all. Oh, Joey, you're muted okay. still. I, I'm gonna throw this out there. I'm not sure somebody did touch on this a little bit, but maybe they can go a little bit further. So uh, anticoagulant rodenticide exposure, uh, non-lethal leavens can can lead to perceived um, perceived behavior behavioral differences in our coyotes. Can anyone speak to that, or is there some data that supports that? I'm not sure about the behavioral differences. I'd have to look more into the literature on that one. Um, I know there are a variety of impacts um, that can be lethal or non-lethal depending on um, the amount that's ingested. I don't know if anyone else has an answer to that one. Good I question. Quite, I didn't quite hear all the question, but I mean, if the, if the question was that, that, you know, does their behavior change if they have anticoagulant toxicity in them, you know, the animal starts to get sick. So, I mean, it, just like when we're sick or injured, our behavior can change. So I think, I think logically that they're, you know, based on the individual, some people hide their hurt better than others. But um, I think that my guess is the answer would be yes. I mean, and we've seen that in other animals with some of that. And I think it also depends on the drug as well, that the, the anticoagulant and how much the animal's gotten too. But, you know, that's just a broad brush there. So. Okay. Thank you, Katie and Chris. So let's see, someone has noted that a University of Washington study done by Timothy Quinn in 1997, uh, in urban residential areas, cats were preferred food by coyotes. A lot of people were not aware of how serious it is to let their cats out in neighborhoods. They also noted that pets are hunted by coyotes in broad daylight, not just at risk from dusk to dawn. Uh, I've seen cats uh, attack mid-morning, long after dawn. Can anybody speak to the study or some other um, insightful information about the hunting of, coyote, uh, hunting of cats by coyotes here in the city? 
I talk a little bit about it. So one, that study was done sizable time ago. Um, so likely things have changed a little bit. Two, it's using what we call kind of a, a uh, an older technique, which is where they actually physically would break open the scats and look at kind of like what physical components are left over. And what that doesn't really tell us are these things that are easily digested. So things like pet foods, fruits, things like that, that aren't gonna leave a trace. Um, a lot of this is also done through kind of individually identifying hairs to species, which is not particularly easy. So these studies, while they do give us some information, I would say using our genetic techniques, we'll be able to determine a lot more accurately what they're actually doing. So yes, coyotes do eat cats. Um, I think it's probably less frequently than people assume it is. Um, we're still kind of waiting for that, but I can tell you that like uh, from personal anecdotal experience, I picked up about a thousand scats within Seattle. I can only tell you that like four of them visually had cat in them. So it doesn't seem to be a super high prevalence within their scats, at least from a visual perspective. And, and I'll, I'll add to that just briefly. We do um, see photos of cats on our, our camera traps um, and coyotes often. Um, and the same cats over and over again and the same coyote, or we don't know if they're the same coyotes. Um, so we do know they coexist and it's not the situation where if a cat is out, it's instantly going to be killed by a coyote. And I wanna say that coyotes do kill cats. So please keep your cats safe. And I'd like to add to that that the, the study that Sam talked about earlier done in the Los Angeles area and the percentage of, you know, scat findings, uh, as, as Sam pointed out, showed that 1.3% uh, of the scat studies were cats. But to dig a little deeper into those, that 1.3%, almost all of those were found in coyotes that were predating on feral cat populations in large green areas or parks where there were known feral cats to be prevalent in the area. So it's a very small percent. And the coyotes that were eating cats were tending to get feral cat populations rather than domestic cats. Um, I'm sure they do get a few, but the percentage is very, very small. There's just usually easier prey for them to get a hold of to make a meal out of than a cat. Okay, uh, let's see. So I got a couple of coyote lifestyle questions. So where are coyotes during the day? They, they want to know in particular, are they hanging out in parks? And also the coyote pups, you know, um, how many actually survived that first year? Anyone? Probably Sam, but why don't you take a stab at it, Sam, and then sure. others can jump in. Sure. I mean, I, we don't have coyotes collared in Seattle, but I can imagine that they're probably hanging out in parks and kind of dense shrubbery during the day. Um, I think from the camera traps, they do seem to have a lot of napping coyotes just in front of cameras during the day. So I imagine they're just kind of hanging out in our green spaces. Um, I know that in some neighborhoods, they're more likely to kind of hang out in people's backyards from what I hear, um, where there's green spaces that are less prevalent, but they do seem to kind of prefer these kind of denser shrubby areas. Um, in terms of pups, we don't, we don't know the survivability in Seattle specifically, but urban areas typically have higher pup survival. They're most likely to be killed by cars. In San Francisco, I think there's something like 60% survival and then the rest kind of get hit by cars um, while they're dispersing away from these home areas. So typically pretty high survival. We don't know specifically for Seattle, but I imagine it's, it's similar, um, similar to other urban areas. Anyone else want to add to that? I, I just want to add that other urban studies, and, and Sam hit on this already, I mean, they have shown that these animals do prefer larger contiguous green spaces. And, and it's really that habituation factor. I mean, they do have a level of passive, you know, understanding that, hey, I can go through that open uh, cemetery, you know, not to anthropomorphize, but everything's fine. And I go to the other side of the green belt. But the thing is, when we start seeing them hang out in our backyard and people send in pictures, not just coyotes too, we'll have, you know, occasionally I've had people from, see most recently was Woodenville and they had a bobcat hanging out in their backyard, just lounging, which bobcat usually don't do that. <laughs> so, so that's a habituation pattern there is feeling, it was feeling fine. And that's, that's like with, with what uh, Robert was getting at. That's an opportunity to haze. 
mindful hazing there. Um, and then maybe some exclusionary efforts with fencing. You know, those animals, that's our space. That's not their space. So uh, we want to see them in those green spaces and observe them there when they're acting wild and going about their wild behaviors and learning to understand that uh, and learning about their life history that way and learning about that individual animal that lives in your local park. Uh, but see them in your backyard, although cool initially, um, is not what a wild animal of that type really should be comfortable with. Okay. Thank you, folks. Uh, so our next question. So we have a person who lives on Mercer Island and said, our coyotes showed up a year ago, but were killed two months ago. A wildlife agency said that they were problematic. Are coyotes killed in Seattle? And what was so special about the Mercer Island pair that demanded that they be destroyed? I can take a stab at this. Um, coyotes are not special on Mercer Island. Uh, and we've seen the same situation play out. Um, I've, I've been working for the department for 15 and a half years, and it's, it's no different. Um, you know, we've had, I've, we've given talks in the greater Seward area before. Um, we've had people concerned. We've had folks say, uh, my cat was taken. What happens is, you know, they, the, the agencies come in and we try to work with people. The municipality tries as well, but you know, we're, we're reacting there. It's really on you, the community, to have that cultural shift and work together to avoid these animals developing this behavior. Because what happens once they've hit that behavioral really point where people are getting all upset and not necessarily understanding that that animal wasn't like that at one point, uh, that's where there's this, you know, people need some sort of action at that point. And really the action's on you, on, on your long-term activity and how you handle living around these urban wildlife, not just coyotes, um, and keeping them wild. You know, and uh, when an agency has to come in and work with the city there, you know, they're, they're having to do outreach as well. You know, like, for example, uh, wildlife services that had to do that, you know, those folks, we work with them they don't want to take out those animals either. And they get to a point where, you know, people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're developing, you know, this list of, okay, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And then unfortunately they have to take an individual or two out sometimes. And I think the point of all this is that can really be avoided. And they say the same thing when they come into those situations, um, you know, whether it be Mercer Island, West Seattle, Magnolia, Tacoma, Everett, it's always the same thing. Unfortunately, um, it really just comes down to people keeping that understanding at the forefront of their property management and working with your community. So nothing new. And I think, I, yeah, I think to address the numbers, I think that it's a relatively rare occurrence. So, um, you know, I think we've all been doing pretty well at coexisting, <laughs> which yeah, is great. Yeah. Yeah. And I Robert, think, uh, I was just going to add it. One of the reasons we're all here talking to you this evening is that we want to try to convey how normal it is for these animals to be on the landscape and how most of the time um, there is a very strong effort on everyone's, on the coyotes part and hopefully on our part to coexist. And that these extreme instances that Chris is talking about, oftentimes it's not even the case when people see animals and they just don't really know what following or escorting behavior is, they can feel threatened. And I think our job is to help people understand that some of these behaviors are very normal and aren't a cause for concern. Um, and, and we can try to not let it get to that place where there's so much um, fear and, out and uh, outcry that an agency has to come in and do something. Um, so that, that's part of our job, and that's now part of your job since, uh, since you've attended this, this workshop. So, so um, just kind of a general question. Why do coyotes howl? Uh, do coyotes eat birds, lizards, insects, fish, and whatever they catch that's smaller than them? And Sam's map show coyotes live on Vashon Island. Do coyotes swim there? All good questions. So as far as I know, coyotes howl for a couple different reasons. One, it's just their way of communicating with each other. Um, I don't know if I have anything else actually to add for that. They're communicating with each other, just like you and I talking. Uh, I think it can also be territorial, but uh, yeah, mainly just communication. Um, coyotes will basically eat anything they can get their hands on, fruit, lizards, snakes, 
small birds, mammals, anything really. Um, but I, I think, was there a third question before Vashon? Um, nope, that's Vashon. Okay, Vashon. 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 Yeah, so Vashon Island actually has lots of mammals on it. Um, both Vashon and Bainbridge, likely that coyotes did just swim over. It's not that far. I think between uh, Kitsap and Vashon, it's about seven kilometers, so not too far. Um, it does look like there was a very limited colonization event on Vashon. So a couple individuals came over, had pups, and those individuals are now continuing to breed with each other. So they're very inbred on Vashon. Um, but yeah. Okay. And can I, can I add one more thing, Joey? Sure. Um, there have been some studies about vocalizations in coyotes. And to my knowledge, the only thing that hasn't been documented in terms of what coyotes may be communicating about is that they just killed something. So all, all the people who think that when they hear coyotes howling and barking, they're standing over a, a dead kill, it's probably not the case. Okay. And just kind of um, somebody wanted to remind people that coyotes can easily jump over six foot fences and dig under a fence in less than 45 seconds. I uh, just want to, is that something that you all can kind of attest to, or is, is that a, a fair uh, assumption that those are some of the powers that coyotes have? I'll, I'll take the, the jumping and someone else can take the digging. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they are, they are good at jumping fences. And um, there are, if you have um, an, a space or, you know, livestock or something, chicken, something that you really need to protect, there's a, a cool device called a coyote roller. Um, and I think they can be purchased. You might be able to construct them. I'm not sure, but it's basically like um, a cylinder that rolls. And so when the coyote tries to jump, it can't get purchased. It just rolls and rolls. And so it can't get up and over. So, um, so if you really need to keep a coyote out from somewhere, uh, the coyote rollers can be of, of help. Um, anyone else want to talk about the digging? Uh, you know, with the digging, um, you know, and it, it's the same thing, you know, uh, coyote rollers or angled out angular extensions off fences, hot wires. And then with digging, you know, putting uh, hardware cloth, you know, expanded wire mesh, uh, you know, two feet out uh, or either 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 just straight out or uh, more ideally down and out. So down at least 12 inches and then out another two feet. Uh, we have other um, examples of that at our Living with Wildlife. I think the zoo has guidance on that as well. Um, and a whole host of a lot of other entities throughout North America that, that uh, basically are all saying the same thing uh, to, to, hey, communities, please work together to do this stuff because this is what helps keep all these wild animals uh, wild rather than I don't quite know if I'm wild or not and, uh, you know, confused. So... Uh, but yeah, definitely. And there's diagrams on our website and I'm sure there are on a lot of other ones too for uh, how to keep them from digging out. So, And, and I, at this point, I want to note that the, the, the webpage that Chris um, is talking about is Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Living with Wildlife um, pages. And I referenced that to many people this time of year who are complaining about flickers trying to get into their home. But it's also a way to learn how to attract wildlife if that's beneficial to you. So it really is a helpful uh, opportunity for you to learn more about how we are in these territories and we're so um, flush with these wildlife living right at our borders. How do we invite and, you know, uh, this, um, excuse me, help them choose not to uh, hang out with us too much longer. Uh, I do want to note that someone mentioned um, about the coagulants that uh, people, you know, with the thanks of, with the thanks to someone else who was actually on the chat, um, that they learn to start using bait traps as opposed to coagulants. And also that coagulants also hurt a lot of raptors because they will pick up a dead rodent. And someone was quick to point out that in Lincoln Park last year, there were two uh, owls that died of rodenticide. So we definitely want to move away from those things. Um, here's an interesting one. Has the homeless population impacted our coyotes? That's a great question. I will definitely see if others want to jump in here. Um, 
I was actually reading a cool book about the environmental history of Seattle, and it I, it mentioned a hundred years ago. It mentioned that the Lower Woodland Park, which is right near Woodland Park Zoo, um, was actually uh, planned as a camp place, so people could come and camp, and and people stayed. Um, and it became very popular. And it was commented that there were a lot of rats there a hundred years ago, um, attracted by, you know, all that kind of activity and probably food and things being left around. Um, so I don't know if anyone has studied this in Seattle in our current era, um, but I can imagine that we have some similar things going on where, um, you know, rodents could be attracted and, and maybe that would bring coyotes into closer proximity with people. Um, but I don't know if anyone has studied that in our, our current situation. I can speak to that a little bit uh, with respect to raccoons, if not coyotes. We did a diet study a few years back on raccoons in various parts of South and Southwest Seattle. And we were looking at something called stable isotopes in their hair that actually let you detect a signature of essentially corn versus native foods. And it's a signal of how much people food these species are eating versus wild food. And we found that the raccoons we were trapping nearest the um, a relatively large homeless encampment at the north end of Beacon Hill actually had the most corn signature in their diet. Now it's pretty anecdotal. We don't know if that's because they were foraging from food at the encampment or if it was just a coincidence, but that was one example we saw in our own work. All right, so this might be our last question of the evening. It's kind of a multi-parter here. Um, someone wants to know how long have the sewer park coyotes lived there? And does their range go down to Pritchard Beach? Um, you know, just how far are our sewer park um, coyotes going? And I think Ed can tell you about the distance that he's seen some of them travel, but I welcome to open this question up to others, please. Yes. Um... When I first came to work at the Audubon Center at Sewer Park 2011, uh, we didn't have any coyotes in the park, but I'd heard from people that I talked to that coyotes had previously had den there and had had pups. Um, there was a, a lot of off-leash dog activity in the park. And so my hypothesis was that just with so many dogs off-leash, coyotes had moved off the peninsula. Four years ago was when we first uh, detected our, our mama coyote, our female, the one that you saw in the slides in the video earlier this evening, uh, reappeared on the peninsula. Um, the following year, uh, she was seen with a male that was very dark colored male. And for the past three years, uh, she's had successful litters of pups. And again, as Sam pointed out, um, this past year she had five pups. So. It's been a fairly recent arrival on the Seward Park Peninsula, about four years since she's first made her appearance. And um, I live about six miles north of there in the um, uh, Madrona Madison Valley neighborhood and right up Howell Street. Um, I saw a coyote that looked very similar to her. In fact, um, I think it was her walking right up the hill in Howell Street. Uh, I've seen a coyote looks very similar and I think it was her at the entrance to the Washington Park Ab Arboretum on Madison. Uh, I've seen her moving down, coming back from an owl prowl that I've led in Seward Park. Uh, in Leshy, I've seen her walking on the sidewalk. So yeah, they can cover a lot of territory. They can trot right along. And so I would say I, it was it's totally plausible um, that our coyotes would be down to Pritchard Beach and perhaps even beyond down to Beersheba Park or Atlantic City Beach. So yeah, so for the last four years, uh, we've had coyotes in Seward Park and um, they do uh, they do peregrinate, they move all around. So yep, I bet they're down at Pritchard Beach too. I can say genetically, I haven't found the Seward Park coyotes in Pritchard Beach. Um, I have found them all the way up to Leshy, especially the, the male is the one that I've, it seems he seems to roam a little bit farther. They do seem to spend a lot of time in Genesee Park as well. Um, through genetics, I can tell you that the, the two coyotes that live at Pritchard Beach, one of them is probably one of the dispersed pups from the Seward Park coyotes. So they are genetically related, um, but they might be different coyotes, or I can tell you they are different coyotes there. I don't know if the Seward Park coyotes also go there, but I have not detected them there. 
Janice, did you have something you wanted to note there? Um, yeah, I wanted to say that uh, one of the first sightings that I had was more than 10 years ago, and it was in November. And I remember it distinctly because it was at the road that goes up towards the uh, upper loop of Seward Park. There was a male coyote, I think, who was quite large and he was sitting in the grass and he had a turtle and he was flipping it back and forth. And I could tell because it had the yellow underside of the turtle and it was like trying to flip it to, I don't know, try to crack the case. And it had a really, um, kind of dense fur coat. And I was thinking at first, was it a wolf? Because it had so much fur and it was in November. So that was more than 10 years ago uh, that I saw this uh, first started sign coyotes, but it was kind of a rare occurrence. And for you folks out there who aren't too familiar with this area, uh, when Ed and Sam were referencing these parks, I think you're talking about a distance of five, six, and maybe even seven miles away from Seward Park. So that's a little bit of territory to cover, especially if you have a lane paw. So um, at this point, I just want to let all of our, uh, once again, thank all of our panelists for you know, sharing their evening, their time, their expertise with us. Um, and I do want to give them each an opportunity to have a parting shot before we sign off. And I'll start with you, Katie. Just want to say thank you to everyone as well for being here, all of our panelists and participants. Sam? Yeah, thank you for everyone for coming. I hope you enjoy and learn something. Mark? Yeah, thanks to everyone for showing up tonight. And I hope you learned some great information you can take back to your community to help you better coexist with wildlife. How about you, Robert? Yep, like everyone said, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for attending and please share some of this information with your neighbors. Janice, how about you? Um, thanks for allowing uh, community input um, from a local, local coyote lover. All right, and Chris? Oh, I just wanna say thanks to everyone and um, thanks for your time to uh, out of your evening to watch us uh, and you know, Naz, now this really the, the ball's in your court. I mean, yeah, learn learn about these animals. Take turn off TV, go out, watch them in their uh, native habitat uh, around here and in, in the natural areas, uh, and you know work with your community to say, hey, look, they're over there. Let's keep them that way. And Ed, I'll echo Chris and that yeah, they're better. It's better than TV, and um, yeah. Network with your community. Um, if they have questions, share what you learned with them tonight. That's the whole point of, of this panel is to inform uh, the populace. Uh, so spread the word that we can coexist with these animals. Um, they don't need much from us. And uh, if we provide the few things that they do need, um, we can all get along and we can enjoy them and they can go about their lives doing their thing as, as nature had intended for them to do so. Thank you all for uh, joining tonight and spread the good word. All right. So um, up to our audience, thank you for welcoming us into your home or into your van or into the car as you drive down the highway and you're listening on the phone and not actually looking at the screen. We truly appreciate this. Uh, if you want to share this um, presentation with others, it will be on the Sewer Park Audubon Center's um, page um, at, in YouTube. And it will also be on our Rewind page at Sewer Park Audubon uh, excuse me, excuse me sewerpark.audubon.org. We'll also be emailing these links out to you as well as information on how to follow the studies and connect with the people who are participating tonight. Those will go out by email, just like your reminders for tonight's program. Thank you. And by the way, this coming Saturday in Sewer Park, they're going to be celebrating the Tory and they're going to be some dignitaries there, maybe somebody whose initials are BH, I don't know but there'll be taiko drummers, there'll be majorettes, there'll be, um, let's see, a, 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 a Chinese dragon dance and plenty more. If you get there early enough, you'll get a cookie that shapes like a cherry blossom. And then on Sunday, we're gonna be welcoming the artwork of Denise Takahashi. We're gonna have an opening in the Gary O Gallery and both of these events are free of charge. You can find more information of those at sewerpark.audubon.org. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful